Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Clay, and I joined the Hill Cannon Center as its director of climate policy about a month ago. We're so pleased to be here today to welcome so many of you to this important and timely discussion with people both in the room and online. Their attendance really speaks to the critical role of Ms. Cannon's vision to provide constructive and optimistic responses to the most daunting challenges facing society, and climate change is clearly at the top of that list. We'll start today's event with a presentation by Ms. Cannon's Deputy Director of Climate Policy, Shane Honolulu, on her new research examining the carbon intensity of various nations and the impact that has for carbon border adjustment. After Shane's presentation, we'll have a discussion with our fantastic panelists here about the future of carbon So without further ado, I will hand it over to Katrina. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. How are you all doing on Monday? Great. 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 Great weather. Thank you so much for making it here to our in-person uh, office building. As you see, we have some nice view out there. Um, we'll have a networking event after this uh, panel discussion. Please stay, chat with us, enjoy some brownies and cookies, and have some tea and coffee. Um, I see some a lot of familiar faces here. I look forward to catching up with all of you after after the panel discussion, which will end at 1 p.m. Um, there are some of you I haven't met in person. I would love to learn from you, you know, what you're working on, why you're interested in this topic. So I look forward to meeting a lot of you after the discussion. And uh, a quick self-introduction for those who have just arrived. My name is Shutin Pamela. I am a Deputy Director of Climate Policy at the Niskan and Centrist Climate Team. And for the next eight minutes or so, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it quick. Alex gave me a hard job that he tapped me to set the scene for, for what's going on in climate. So um, I'm going to present to you all my new research paper that was released last month in September. Um, the title is, Is the US really a global leader in low carbon industry? A quick, quick answer, quick preview is, no, it's not, but I'll tell you why very shortly. Um, uh, the paper's research findings were featured in a Time Magazine exclusive news article um, when the paper was published. So if you're interested, please come to me. I'll send you the paper's link and the news Time Magazine article's link. Um, for um, everyone on Zoom, hi, nice to meet you. We have more than 50 people have signed up online to join us virtually too. Uh, so hello to you all. Um, I think our comms team have already shared a link to the paper and the Time Magazine article. And so over the next few minutes, I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk about three sections of uh, my, my presentation. One is I'll walk you through why is carbon border justice important? Second, I will talk about uh, my research findings in a table. And lastly, I'll give you three key takeaways from my presentation. Um, let's dive right in. Why is carbon border adjustment important? Um, for no, those of you who are familiar, in the climate policy world, we have Taylor, saying the Inflation Reduction Act for the 360 billion tax incentives for the clean energy industries. That is to giving out a lot of money to industry to invest in clean energy. And we have sticks. Um, let's put a price on per ton of emissions, incentivize emission reduction. And typically for sticks, we're talking about a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. And when I talk about carbon border adjustment, I'm talking about it in the context of the state policy, the climate climate price, uh, uh, the carbon price policy of carbon tax. Um, so what is a carbon border adjustment? So for those of you who have followed um, the news a lot lately, uh, you might have seen a lot of abbreviations or jargon being thrown around a lot, uh, including carbon border adjustment, carbon border fees, carbon pollution fee, carbon border tax, um, for carbon border adjustment, I, I need to set the scene here that the textbook case of uh, carbon border adjustment is, is a policy that would levy a tax on imported goods and rebate to exported goods. 
Um, now, in the context of a carbon tax, a carbon border adjustment would tax the consumption of carbon intensive products instead of taxing the production of carbon intensive products. So, imported products, they're for domestic consumers, consumers, so they're taxed. Domestically produced products are for domestic consumption, they're also taxed. But exported products, they're for foreign consumption. So they would get a rebate when they get exported uh, to other countries. So that is what is a carbon border adjustment. Why is it important? Um, a big problem with taxing production of carbon intensive goods and services is in an open economy is companies might have incentives to pack up and go. Okay, in the US, if you were to have $50 per ton carbon tax tomorrow, I'm going to pack up and go to, say, Bangladesh. That I just confirmed yesterday that they don't have a carbon price or a carbon tax. I might just move my production facility there and produce there. Um, that is one uh, way of carbon leakage that domestic consumers, the domestic producers, they might go abroad and emit emissions overseas. Another way of the leakage, gar carbon leakage, um, is when we import a product into the U.S. for domestic consumption, those goods and services might not be subject to the same carbon pricing. So when they're coming in, they're not competing on a level playing field with domestic uh, producers. So a border adjusted carbon tax would do several things. A border adjusted carbon tax would tax domestic production, the production that is uh, for domestic consumption, it will be taxed. So imported goods coming in, they're for domestic consumption, um, they're also taxed. Exported goods are for um, foreign consumption, they will be exempted. So the end result, end goal for border adjusted carbon tax is a company would be indifferent to where to locate its production facility as long as it's selling to U.S. consumers. Let's walk it through again. If a U.S. company is based in the U.S., selling to the U.S. consumers, it will need to pay for the current price. If, the U if a company is based in a foreign country selling to U.S. consumers coming in, you need to pay the current price. But if you're selling to foreign consumers, whether you're located in the U.S. or located in a foreign country, you don't pay the current price. Um, so that is what a border adjusted carbon tax do. It equalizes the tax burden between the domestic producer in the U.S. and a foreign producer. A border adjustment is not something new. It's widely used in other types of taxes like excise tax and value added taxes. Um, now, people are very confused uh, sometimes about carbon border adjustment and tariffs. Um, like I said, carbon border adjustment include import taxes and export rebates to be implemented with a domestic tax. And tariffs, we're just talking about standalone, standalone carbon tariffs. We're not talking about any domestic carbon price, no export rebates. And I'm gonna give you a very overview why uh, carbon tariffs are problematic. The better policy is border adjusted carbon tax. First of all, standalone carbon tariffs would violate WTO's um, non-discriminatory rules. That would be a big problem. Second is it would just further escalate the trade tension with our partners and then um, lead to more and more trade wars. And third is it, putting tariffs on imported products does nothing to incentivize domestic producers to further decarbonize. You're not, you're not putting a price on domestic production. And lastly is if you're not implementing a carbon price domestically, it would be administratively daunting or a nightmare to implement the tariffs to how to justify to your partners, trading partners, what um, what dollar amount you're putting on tariffs. Now, very quickly, um, the tariffs, um, the, currently the debate is framed around um, competitiveness issue with carbon border adjustment. So some politicians and I think some policy analysts, they have been framing the issue as competitive. Um, if we implement carbon border adjustment in the US, then 
because the U.S. Um, is believed to be cleaner than the rest of the world and will like punish other foreign countries and make them pay for their pollution. And there, there are several problems with that narrative, and I'm sure we'll go into that in our panel discussion. I can't wait for our discussion. Um, but one, one of the problems is problematic um, uh, is because uh, this table coming from a new paper, it shows that the U.S. actually just falls in the middle of the pack uh, among the major trade in terms of carbon intent across major fossil fuel and manufacturing industries. Um, this is a weighted index where the U.S. is set to one. Um, other countries are set as a ratio compared to one. If you're cleaner, if you're much less carbon intensive, better performers like the UK, the EU, and Japan, um, they're in the green, green budget. Um, peers with the US in terms of carbon intensity, what we found is Canada, Mexico, and South Korea. Um, not surprisingly, not surprisingly, China, Russia, India, we found them to be much more carbon intensive than the US and the rest of the world too. So um, based on the table, again, the US falls in the middle of the pack. Now a word of caution, when we were doing this research, one of our um, key takeaways, the emissions data is not perfect, it's not mature compared to corporate tax data, profit data, cost data, census data, we're talking about emissions data. We're talking about this paper, this piece of paper card. What are the amount of emissions associated with this piece of paper or a sheet of steel? Like we're only looking at industry level data and the data is noisy. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done and based on different data sets and the measuring standards and reporting processes. Um, different data sets might have this discrepancies across uh, the different regions. Um, so that is the table, and I'm gonna wrap up my presentation there quickly because I can't wait to have a wonderful discussion with my fellow panelists. Um, three key takeaways, just to reiterate. Um, first, carbon tariffs, standalone carbon tariffs without domestic carbon price would be problematic. WTO rules, trade war, administratively very difficult, provide little incentive for domestic producers. And second, um, a border adjusted carbon tax would be a much better climate policy to address climate change um, uh, domestically in the United States. And last but not least, just to reemphasize my point. Um, there's a lot of important work that needs to be done in the carbon emissions data measuring space. Um, and I, I can explain why on the panel. Thank you all. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Flint from the Alliance for Market Solutions, and Xu Ting asked me to moderate this. It's a real pleasure. If doing anything with Xu Ting is interesting to both times. We had a very important dinner one time where we sat Xu chairman of the Alliance for Market Solutions, and afterwards he said, you sat me next to a brilliant woman. You're doing great work, to which I simply said, yes, we are. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Alex, can you speak up a little bit? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, Max Brunick, uh, Senior Policy Advisor of E3G, I want to commend some of his writing to all of you that uh, I've driven, derived a lot of questions for today. The first one year after the Inflation Production Act, his analysis of the impacts of that. He's also written on embodied carbon emissions, meaning and measurements. And what Xu Ting was just discussing, the need for data. Uh, very pleased to be joined with by Barry Robb, the Ira and Nikki Harris Family Professor of Public Policy um, at the Ford School at the University of Michigan, author of a seminal book uh, on 2018, Can We Price Carbon, which is 
has taught me every part of the issue I need to consider, if not the answers as things go forward. I want to focus today on the long term outlook for order carbon pricing and carbon pricing, not so much the details of where we stand with whatever's happening in Congress today, but an understanding of the strategic environment as we look out over the next couple of de decades. And so I want to start with Max. Max, tell me about the role of carbon order adjustments in this world in which we see changing rates of economic development around the world, changing populations. We see shifts in global manufacturing due to a whole lot of causes. Talk about the broader landscape and how the issue we're talking about today fits into it. Right, well, thank you, Alex. And yes, indeed, so there's of course not just one decision factor for company location or where markets evolve. And um, we see that, for example, in Europe with the energy costs being a main driver. And of course you can see, well, the carbon price is part of the energy costs. You can, you can argue that way, but I mean, when I say the energy costs, I mean the actual price of electricity and gas, and that's a major driver there. And then on top, you have the carbon price. But it is very interesting. You ask about the longer term perspective. There is currently a lot of development happening in the um, US and in Europe, Europe moving ahead with the emissions trading system and the accompanying CBAM carbon border adjustment mechanism and the US contemplating following. But you're totally right. These are currently very important economies, still will be in the near future, but of course there are other players. And increasingly, they are also considering their options. First, there was a lot of pushback against the European carbon border adjustment mechanism with threats of litigation. And I think they're still very valid and real, but they also follow a second track, both India, China, but even in Africa, there's discussion about why should we give this money away? Why shouldn't we do this at home too? So there's a lot of talk about it. And of course, Canada, the UK, there's a lot of players moving into this terrain and they might not all do exactly the same system the same approach it's very interesting but it seems we're moving into that direction what will it do for climate is a big question though because if we look at the european approach right now it is not a safe all it's not saving us from doing additional climate policy it is just a little element in the toolbox. It can be important, it's important for signaling, but it's not the only one tool that we need to go to uh, under 1.5 degrees. So this is really just one element. And the same way when we look at the US situation, it's certainly not, it's neither gonna save businesses here or sectors, because it's not it's not a wall, it's just it's just the price correction. That's the idea. And it's also not gonna get us to the 50% uh, NEC target for 2030 or net zero in the in the longer run. So this is not enough, but it can be part of the solution. And of course, the major risk is to have a more fragmented trade world as a result of this. Uh, with more um, trade costs and uh, less flexibility in our supply chains and um, and also geopolitical fallout. Not, not, uh, you know, that's not a minor concern there. So this is often a little bit ignored when people talk about it. It's not just a policy for industry. It also has um, diplomatic geopolitical ramifications. So that that's just maybe as, as a very broad response to your question. Happy to to go into more details. So I am going to come back and work off the term you used, which was the signal that it is sending to the global economy. But I want to next go to Barry. So Canada, we are their largest trading partner. They have an explicit price on carbon. They are in many ways ahead of other countries in this regard. Tell me about the 
the, the need for and the politics of a carbon border adjustment in Canada vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but also all of their trading partners. What's, what should we expect from our friends? To them? Right. Thank you, Alex. And, and thank you to Shuting and friends of Wisconsin for the invitation to be part of this conversation. Um, I think Canada really is an intriguing case to think about because so much of the writing and commentary thus far on carbon border adjustments is focused on the American position, the European Union position, and then maybe China. But Canada sort of falls into that sort of middle power issue, and especially as you point out, Alex, because of its huge interdependence with the United States economically. In most recent years, energy intensive exports are about 75% that Canada sends out comes to the United States. Between 50 and 60% of their imports come from the United States. So there's a very, very large interdependency, as well as the fact that the American population and economy is so much larger than that of Canada. So there's always those kinds of asymmetries. It's also no secret that the US and Canada have struggled mightily over the last 25 years or more to begin to align policies in energy and climate. Rarely have we seen a president and a prime minister, a parliament and a Congress moving in roughly the same direction at the same time. Canada really began to move in about the middle of the last decade, particularly after the election, the first election of Justin Trudeau in 2015, to build on leading edge provincial examples in carbon pricing, such as the British Columbia carbon tax, which has been studied from around the world, and put together a classically Canadian framework, mindful that in Canada's constitution, Provinces have enormous power and say federal powers are really limited in many, many ways in Canada beyond that we see in the United States. And built on that framework and developed it into what is now known as the Pan-Canadian framework. So currently that price sits at $65 a ton Canadian across Canada. There's a more federalized fuel fee, which is somewhat more nationalized but there's an, also an output-based industrial performance system that varies much more province to province, territory to territory. But a huge part of the current government's plans to hit their Paris targets is to take that $65 a ton Canadian and get to 170 by the end of this decade. And there in lies some really interesting issues and questions. Uh, currently, the Canadian government is in a consultative room. Canadians like to use that phrase a lot. They certainly are doing it with regard to CBAP. But as they look at their two major partners, they like to the European Union, the ETS, a large carbon pricing system that you've described, you've been talking about and writing about, Max, where they actually look fairly close in terms of overlap, even pricing <laughs> targets. But then there's this dominant partner in the United States, which has a pretty ambitious new climate policy in terms of subsidies, but sets the national carbon price at zero without any clear path to moving in that direction. So I think going forward, there is this really, really interesting question politically, having taken a very big political risk and in Trudeau's two subsequent reelections in 2019 and 2021, stayed the course and continued to develop that. Where does Canada fit into the CBAM discussions going forward? Whether that's a multilateral discussion or a global one, but also then looking forward to elections in 2024 or 2025, because we're beginning to see more and more pressure on the Trudeau government to actually slow down or perhaps even cut back that carbon pricing system. Uh, how how does Canada play this? Well, I, I think that's a great question. And I want to turn back to the other two to get their comments. Do, do you think Canada and the EU and maybe even these emerging efforts in China and Japan will result in some sort of agreement on carbon border adjustment mechanisms among that set of countries and leave the United States out? Or, or how, how do you see this unfolding? Because you ended with a question. What's the answer to the question? You want to go first? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, a, it's a very good question because there are, there are of course, ideas about coordination um, in various fora. I mean, there was the idea of a climate club under the German G7 presidency that I would say, I mean, still could be a place to find such an agreement, at least among the G7 partners to find, even if it's not a fully synchronized system, maybe some ways of establishing equivalency or compatibility 
But there are a lot of question marks about this um, club. It exists, so that's a good thing. Um, but we don't know much more about it. their members to the climate club, their prospective members to the climate club, including non-OECD countries, which also makes it really interesting. But at this point, it's it's a very very uh very fluid thing, and it might become more or not. Uh, a lot of G7 initiatives just exist somewhere out there and um, will not get picked up by the next presidency. The Japanese G7 presidency was not very interested in the concept. And I have to say it was also partially lack of diplomacy on the side of the German presidency to just push this forward, use the momentum of the presidency without seeking enough support because you always need to build coalitions so this is where it stands now which is kind of ironic because a lot of countries are officially members of the climate club like the us but they couldn't really oh they don't care that much about it. let's put it that way and of course the other fora as well because this could be um coordinated including the wto obviously uh would make sense, right? It has a much broader member base, but it's also much more difficult to find consensus or to get to anything. And of course, this can also be done bilaterally or in many laterals. Uh, who knows? Um, if you just look at the state of multilateralism or international cooperation in general, it does not look extremely promising at the moment that this will be the area where people uh, join, um, you know, reach out and, and uh, find, find room for compromise and, and uh, collaboration. That's just my personal view, of course. And nobody knows the future. And that's a nice thing. Things aren't always linear. So what we see right now is, of course, a certain trajectory, but then there are inflection points and things happen that nobody could see. And so who knows? Maybe there is a room for you know, finding together, coming together. Um, but I'm I'm a little bit skeptical, at least for the next uh, decade. Yeah, I I would like to. I've I've heard a lot of great words. Thank thanks for bringing up uh, multilateral negotiations at WTO. Um, <clears throat> I would like to uh, build upon Max's point just now that I also share the same. Uh, skeptical sentiment towards um, multilateral uh, uh, negotiations on climate. There are a lot of big words being thrown around these days. You talk about climate club. Um, I think if you talk to 10 people, 10 people might give you 10 different answers of what they think a climate club might be. Now, one of the climate club proposals that might have some teeth is uh, proposed by the famous Nobel Prize winner. Um, um, Morehouse, he proposed that countries in the club, we trade uh, clean, less carbon intensive goods. For all other countries that might not that are not in the club, that's imposed like three or 5% tariffs. So all goods and services coming into the club. So that's one of the proposals I've heard so far that might have some, um, practical implementation suggestions. Um, of course, I looked up the, the German chancellor, the climate club proposals. I, I looked through the documents and it has a lot of um, vague language, I should say, like technical collaboration. I, I don't believe it mentioned tariffs. So um, that is one, one uh, uh, aspect, climate club. So a lot of people propose uh, allies like U.S. and the EU could come together, form a climate club, and then how do we punish China, counter China? I, I'll go back to this. this. This sentiment is really strong right now in, in the Washington, D.C. atmosphere, and I have concerns, uh, great concerns about that. And uh, another multilateral negotiations. Um, so I've actually heard some people have proposed um, WTO is not relevant um, in the climate space. Um, according to some experts, like uh, WTO is not currently not functioning, that the US has blocked 
appointing judges to the appellate body of WTO. And because climate change is such a big problem, we should come up with new rules or use exceptions to address climate change. And WTO might not be the most relevant uh, institution in the climate space. And um, I, I, I had a wonderful opportunity to meet with the director general of the WTO um, a couple of weeks ago in Geneva. And I heard that they are uh, prioritizing climate and trade for their meeting agenda. And I, I think Elton, it was you that shared an article. I asked you to look at that. Um, uh, WTO is um, starting a global pricing initiative. Um, that is WTO. And then I've also heard like some uh, uh, sentiment like maybe OECD could do it. Let's do a global carbon pricing for they, they form an inclusive framework on global pricing earlier this year, February. Let's gather all the countries, OECD, let's whether we can do a global carbon pricing. But if you look at the the global minimum tax, 15%, I don't know if any one of you is a tax expert. Um, I know Max, Max is, Max, I see your face there. Um, pillar one and pillar two is a hot mess. The global negotiations are happening at OECD. It's very messy. And they're, they're currently having a lot of countries involved. And we're talking about the statutory tax rate, effective tax rate. We're talking about tax base, exemptions, deductions. Um, it, it's not impossible, but I just want to build on Max's point. Like it's it's tricky, and and when when we hear all these big words like climate club or uh, global carbon pricing, I think one of my key takeaways for you all to leave this event today is maybe let's dive deep dive into all these big jargons and abbreviations a little bit, and like acknowledge that these kind of negotiations should be difficult. Before my next question, Barry, go on. Now, I've studied these issues of carbon pricing for some time as a political scientist. And my general thesis has been over the years when you're talking about any form of carbon pricing, that would apply to carbon border adjustments as well. The economics is really an intriguing set of arguments. The politics is much, much tougher than anyone anticipates going in. Not impossible especially given the experiments that we see, but do not underestimate political difficulties. And here I would note that this isn't just the domestic politics screwing up the political courage to get a piece of legislation for a tax or trading system. It's a multi-level game. You've got to work the domestic politics and make them stick over time. You need your institutions to be supportive. You have to form your club and form those alliances and have a tight agreement between members of the club and then you've got to play the international game and go global, where there will be winners and losers and ramifications and responses. And much of that in climate policy moves us into largely uncharted territory to think about threading the needle between domestic, club, or multilateral, and global. And here, just if I might invoke the Canadian US case, if there should be an easy slam dunk case for coming into alignment, it should be the United States and Canada on that chart. Canada and the U.S. look very, very similar. And yet, if you look at policy issues, not so much so pricing. If you look at the last five or six years, the Canadians are wary because they're aware that the Trump administration, they had to tear up and reinvent their North American trade agreement because the president was ready to get rid of it. They had to go through years of negotiation to create the USMCA, however one might view that. And in turn, their presumption was all along that if the U.S. moved legislatively on climate, it would probably be some combination of a price and regulation and subsidy, as opposed to the approach that is immersed through the IRA, which is essentially all subsidy. To the point where even though Canada, through an aggressive, aggressive lobbying campaign, to make sure all the wording in the IRA said North America versus the United States, which got very little attention in the U.S., but was like front page news in many for many weeks in Canada. An aggressive lobbying effort on Capitol Hill, state to state, was fought by the Canadian government. Now having to play the other subsidy game, and that is finding revenues and resources to match investment packages that states or provinces have to make to lure battery manufacturing or vehicle manufacturing. Last point, Prime Minister Trudeau, who's Looking in a really, really tough campaign. No prime minister in over 100 years has won four elections in a row. And he, the architect of the system, is coming up for his election. 
took a question about matching American subsidies under the IRA dollar for dollar, including especially these, not the tax credits and incentives, but the investments to draw on the firms. He said, basically, if we did all that and matched the United States dollar for dollar, Canada would lose its AAA credit rating. We can't go there. We're too small. We can't play with the United States. So if you're going to reconcile all of this and get the U.S. and Canada on the same position on carbon border adjustment, you would think that this is the easiest case imaginable in the world. Cross-border trade, cross-border energy, similar economies, peaceable border. No one's talking about putting up a wall. And yet even there, the slam dunk case is a lot, lot harder, especially when you start to pay attention and listen to the other side. And we generally don't do that very well in the United States when it comes to Canada. So I want to do a quick lightning round. And by the way, later I'll scan the audience. If you have questions, raise your hand later in a few minutes. But I want to start following up on this point. A decade from now, do you think we're going to be considering carbon border adjustments among like economies with similar emissions profiles? Or is this going to be a tool that is used in a protectionist manner of between countries with disparate emissions profiles? 2030 and beyond, right? The IRA will be will be seven years into that. The Canadians will be going forward. The European ETS are are like minded countries going to be negotiating for for the carbon adjustments, or is it going to be a club used against our that contributes to trade contention? Let me put yeah. I mean, if you look at this time frame, that's when the <clears throat> European carbon border. Uh, adjustment mechanism will have full buy because it's getting paced in very slowly from 26 on. So that's interesting because then it will also start to be uh, felt by trade partners, not so much the US, but others. And, um, and of course, the beauty of it is that uh, all these systems should, in theory, at some point fade out, right? I mean, if you have a real net zero economy, then also the carbon price doesn't really matter anymore. And if you trade mostly with other net zero economies, then also there's not much to adjust for, but that's much further down. That's more towards the mid-century point. I think around 2030, that would be the hope that there is coordination. However, no discrimination, right? You mentioned WTO. So this is a, uh, th that's really a um, difficult line to walk, right? You don't want to um, give favors to countries because of political alliance, but because of facts. And also, you want to be able to justify how these decisions are being made. So this is this is interesting. Of course, WTO allows for countries to have trade agreements and to have uh, these kinds of agreements that also result in better trade terms. So that's possible. Um, and I would hope that more of this will emerge. And certainly by the 2030s, that could be negotiated. Uh, which is, I mean, just going back to last Friday, there was a US summit and that just shows you how little is happening so far and how far this, how far we still have to walk. But in 10 years, I'm kind of uh, hopeful we can manage. Yeah, if, if we lose track of the strategic discourse, we'll jump into steel and aluminum the negotiation, yes. right? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold that <laughs> with until we get it. But let me ask, I'm fascinated by details about how this might, might, might unfold in two ways that both of you are in. First, Max, can you comment on what does it take to go from country emissions to facilities emissions to carbon contents of goods? Like, is that possible? Since we don't trade facilities, trade goods, can't imagine. And then after he goes, if a, if another country is interested in a bilateral with the United States, should they go to Washington or should they go to Sacramento? And should they be negotiating for anything? Like, how does a how does a an EU climate minister think about a carbon border adjustment mechanism with the United States? Because we're not a single economy. Right, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to also not go too much into the technical issues, but it's it's definitely, there's a huge difference which numbers you want to look at, whether it's the uh, national industry averages or actual verified emissions. And you opened up this 
other important differentiation whether you talk about the product or facility based needs. Um, and of course, this all gets you very different numbers and different incentive sets, right? So if you say, we're gonna go light on data gathering, like we're gonna make this easy for everybody to use national industry averages. This is maybe not very reliable data, but it's somewhat available. And what happens then is that if you're an importer, um, you have no incentive to import better than this national industry average product because you don't gain anything from it. What's your encouragement unless you find somebody who's still willing to pay a premium, but there's no direct economic incentive there. If you, on the other hand, as a regulator say, we go primarily with the actual verified emissions, that's great for larger companies that have this data anyway from larger economies, but it's then very difficult. We talk to people from Africa and there, there's much less data availability. Obviously they don't trade a lot of steel or aluminum, but this might change and also they're more important in other sectors. So that's just uh, lots of questions there. What do you actually want with it, right? That's then bringing you actually down to the real foundation. Is it to protect domestic industry? Is it to drive global climate action? Is it a tool for equity and justice? That's very different objectives. And I think it's very important to be very clear at the beginning on Amstead, what's your number one priority? And not say, oh, we do everything. Usually politicians say, we have three or four priorities and they're all equally important. But obviously you cannot do this with one tool. Um, I think that's... Yeah. If I may chime in very quickly before we turn it to, to Barry, um, I, I'm, I'm happy Max brought up the, the getting too ambitious, uh, that some politicians try to do too many things at the, at the same time. And I mentioned to you um, all of that. I will talk a little bit about the landscape in DC. Because what we're seeing right now, the momentum in the carbon border adjustment space, I do quote unquote, because I, I, back to my presentation just now, I think a lot of times they're just talking about carbon tariffs. In the US legislation space, we see a lot of um, uh, politicians or proposals being floated around that lead with a climate goal, let's address climate change and let's try to reduce emissions, but have a lot of other agendas uh, on the table. Uh, geopolitically, that's counter China and, and Russia, um, or um, let's also pr protect U.S. domestic workers. You see that the domestic quantum rule in the, in the RA. Um, so let's boost U.S. manufacturing, boost our jobs, also counter China um, geopolitically, um, but lead with the climate change. And, and they only talk about uh, carbon tariffs. They're, they're not interested in any serious discussion or conversation about carbon price. And I think we all know why in this room. Like it's it's politically difficult. And we, we all acknowledge that at the Miscata Summit. It's politically difficult despite it being the most uh, economically most efficient policy. Um, so it, it, it's a challenging, it's a challenging event. And to go back to your question put very quickly just now, the the, the in 10 or 20 years will be like, um, I don't have the crystal balls. So I don't know what they'll be like exactly, but my big concern is I don't want a lot of different countries to use um, uh, address climate change or let's put green tariffs or carbon tariffs and lead to an unfortunate situation with a lot of trade tension, a lot of trade escalation, uh, a lot of trade wars where Collaboration internationally is critical, um, for technology sharing, for finance sharing. Uh, uh, I share the sentiment that the in the Canadians are worried about the U.S. We 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 are not afford we're not able to afford to subsidize our industries. Like I met with a lot of review officials and also came back in Switzerland, and they all share the sentiment. They like we can't afford to subsidize our own like the U.S. does, and it, it is perceived as a protectionist. 
um, policy. So I want to go back to the question, Harry. There's, there's multiple constituencies in the United States when it comes to board department justice. And policymakers in California and New England, I would assume, think about them very differently than others. What are your observations and your thoughts about how that will play out in time? So maybe this is the fourth layer of the game. <laughs> and I appreciate the question, Alex. You know, if we were having this conversation around 2009, <laughs> We would be looking at a nation in which 23 states had pledged formal adoption to a carbon cap and trade system for their power sectors, including three regions, which include the Midwest. We're not at 23 any longer, but we're also not at zero. And so it is interesting to think about these kinds of questions in a big, sprawling federal system. Imagine if we took the 50 states, and I haven't done this analysis, but broke them up, and put them on that chart and looked at carbon emissions intensity. And particularly if you would throw in oil and gas production states that know that once the new database from EPA is released another year and a half, their methane emissions could well go up by a level of 40 to 60% from what has been reported over the last 15 years. Yep. Well, there you begin to see some divides and convergence. And I got a bird's eye view of this because I do quite a bit of work with state legislators, including a session I had recently with others leading, leading training uh, state legislative leaders, speakers of the House of Equivalents from a wide range of states for a long, long set of meetings. And as we began to talk about things like energy efficiency, carbon pricing, carbon border adjustment, which I don't think most of the state legislators in that room have ever heard that phrase before, to be perfectly honest with you. You could kind of get a sense that legislators were beginning to size up what it would mean for their economies to go to any form of a carbon border adjustment system, whether or not there was a federal version in the U.S. or not. And there was a real sense that there would be potential winners and losers. And then what do you do in a case like California? which has lost almost all of its original trading partners, but does have one, and that's the province of Quebec, which is part of the very Canadian system that I mentioned earlier. And that very same system would be grandfathered, presumably, or protected under a carbon border pricing regime that focused on pricing. And then you throw in Washington state, which also has now an economy-wide cap and trade system that may or may not link up to that very system. Or you begin to look at the Reggie states, which is only power sector and has had on off again kinds of relationships. But in some ways, we're talking about a stable coalition there. And we know statistically in these states, the states that have adopted carbon pricing and stayed with it are also the states that have done the most from policy in terms of energy efficiency. They've poured money in, they have their own energy efficiency standards. So my guess would be, again, not having done the maths, you're saying that we would be looking at states all over the place on this. And here's so I would expect two things. States would respond very differently to any kind of a CBAM proposal based on what it would mean for their states. But I'm very confident that officials from states that have sort of gone the distance on carbon pricing or even a newly arriving state like Washington would be saying, well, if we're kind of breaking some of the traditional trade rules and creating clubs. Isn't Canada more like a European club member than an American club member? And on and on it goes. Would that at some point, thinking ahead to 2025, 2030, inspire or encourage other states to consider some adoption of a pricing regime? I don't see any groundswell of states following the Washington adoption of the Clean Competition Act, but that was pretty much given up for dead in 2020. And you begin to see pieces and snippets of this. And so in a federal system like ours, Alex, I would never try to ever predict the future. I guess I just did. Um, <laughs> but say that this is going to be very, very much in play. And I would argue that in places like Sacramento and in Illinois. And now, also, I didn't mention the whole movement to an economy-wide system in New York State, building on Reggie. Uh, these discussions are going to be had, and you're going to have governors and legislators coming to the table and saying, I want most favored status for my, for my jurisdiction. 
Okay, I want to. I'm going to turn to some things that I want to understand the strategic implications of some of the things I'm going to raise that are happening in the near term. First of all, we talk about IRA as a massive subsidy for low carbon, except for methane, right? There is a methane feature. And I'm wondering if that opens a door for border carbon adjustment on LNG, which is a current very important topic with an explicit price in the United States. But that's that's item one on which you can engage. Second topic is um, the aluminum and steel negotiations. It, it, should we expect that to be successfully resolved, or is that just the first example of the EU and the United States beating each other up on a topic? Do you? I'm interested in both your substantive perspective, but also your political thoughts about are we just trying to get that resolved and it's off the table, and then we can move on to the broader discussion, or is this just foreshadowing that the that report is going forward and we can take this in any order you want? Max seems enthusiastic about methane or something. I, I would leave the methane, although this is interesting, it's definitely very interesting. Um, uh, I think it's a, you know, as an area where there is a lot of sort of short-term climate benefits to the game, but I want to come up in on the steel and right. aluminum part. This is super interesting because I do think this will not cause like a dislocation of the transatlantic alliance. I think in the current geopolitical setting, there's, there's, they're moving closer together in terms of um, security and, and um, geopolitics. But I do think this um, these negotiations had a very rough time from the beginning, and it does not look much better now. Um, I mean, there's, of course, is uh, the two parts, the overcapacity part, there's of course the different interests on the European side getting rid of the section 232 uh, tariffs. That's like, if they're honest, that's a number one priority on the European side. And then on the American side, maybe the number one priority is we have some EU CBAM carve out or, uh, well, easement or whatever you want to call this. And um, the climate aspect is totally secondary on both sides. And also the global, I mean, it starts with global arrangement in the naming. The global part seems to also be at least like, maybe we we'll talk about it later. Um, so at the moment, that's not looking extremely promising there. But I do think that's not the end of it all because there are other avenues for improving these sectors. And, and I think that's also, of course, the, the part of the problem, like that was never meant to bring the, U, the US steel and aluminum sector to net zero. That was more or less to cement the status quo and make it a little bit better. But actually you need instruments similar to the Inflation Reduction Act or the methane fee, or something else to drive real decarbonization in sectors uh, in the next electoral cycle here. And same thing in Europe, there's so far not, not happening in these hard to evade sectors. And there's also the arrangement between the two wouldn't have really changed that much about it. So there's a lot of, I think, Maybe not the need to be too worried about it. And I think there will be some consensus, but it's definitely not going to be as uh, satisfactory as one would hope, and especially in climate terms. And I would like to chime in very quickly before turning over to Barry. I assume you want to discuss the methane fee water just now. I don't think uh, Barry is an expert in the, in the methane space. Um, Quickly building on, on Max's point, uh, very quickly, I think the US EU steel aluminum negotiations, they have this very confusing abbreviation for, for the deal to come gas. But anyway, um, I think it's another great example that shows um, how politicians sometimes might want to do too much, too ambitious. And then going <laughs> there is looking, but might not going anywhere specifically. So with the the EU US deal, originally 
their top priority was to lift tariffs on both sides. U.S. lift the tariffs on um, steel and aluminum coming in from the EU. The EU lifts tariffs on the most signature important U.S. exports like Levi jeans and whiskey. So that's their goal, lifting tariffs. And then it shifted to climate which is sitting in the backseat, like green steel aluminum trade. And not many people know exactly what they meant. And I think I read some news articles yesterday. Um, they now shifted the focus is addressing excess market capacity, which is steel specifically coming from China. So uh, they extended the deadline supposed to be concluded by the end of this month in October. I think they gave it a couple more months, but um, it, it's hard. Uh, for going back to the point, like multilateral negotiations, they're challenging, it, it's messy. And one one opportunity not to have everything a, a pessimistic tone, one positive thinking, one great opportunity, I think for the US and the EU uh, to collaborate on this space, whether it's steel, aluminum, this deal or other sectors, is really the emissions, uh, uh, carbon emissions measuring, reporting and validating. Um, if I'm a multinational corporation, I have 150 offices around the world. I have so many operations. I don't wanna be dealing with um, different sets of standards and processes and reporting requirements with the U and the US. So that's something that needs to be driven by the governments, needs to be uh, uh, promoted by, by uh, public-private partnership. And I think that's one opportunity, but where the deal goes, I, I, I'm not sure, not very, and I, I do want to know where does the methane fee create a new dynamic, open any new doors? I think potentially yes. And here I just would, you know, encourage us to shift what happens when we move away from carbon, which is in the focus of more than 95% of the policy science work on climate change in the methane or other short-lived climate movements. I might. Let's begin with the one really functional national and global climate policy that we have, and that's for hydrofluorocarbons. Where the US, averse to pricing, legislated in 2020 with bipartisan support, a cap and trade program that is rapidly being stood up, building on the foundation of a series of HFC taxes in the European Union, and a regime Kigali that has phenomenal, phenomenal inclusion of trade restrictions for non-compliance is an incentive to participate. We're nowhere near a Kigali for carbon, methane, nitrous oxides, or anything else. But to answer your question, question, yes. Historically, there has been one place on earth that does taxation of methane, and it's Norway, which can empirically verify that they routinely capture 99.8 to 99.9% of their gas, and they've been doing this for 35 years. They add it to their carbon taxes. Not only are their, their numbers really, really good, but their metrics are really, really careful, unlike anything I've seen anywhere else in the world. But now there's another player, and it's the United States. And indeed, this comes through a provision of the Inflation Reduction Act. Where one goes by 2025 or 2030, it's not clear. And here I would underscore that I think there will be significant challenges to standing up all of the policies that are envisioned for methane, oil and gas sector methane in the United States. If we develop a credible methane system that is verifiable or comes close to verifiable, close to being accurate, we are still gonna be a long way away. We are gonna see significant pushback from some parts of the industry and some states that have not moved on this issue. We can look at states from what we know that have methane loss rates that compared to Norway, like Colorado and some firms. Others that have lose 5% or more of their gas. And that actually starts to make some of the Russian numbers look actually not so bad. If you look at the Bakken compared to Russia, compared to other areas. So how you pull that together, and whether it's within the capacity of the American political system to allow for a fee to go forward, but not just standalone fee, there's almost $10 billion in various subsidies that go along with this from developing the technology, orphan well bailouts, all the rest, and second tier of EPA standards, best practice standards. 
electric pneumatic controls, monitoring, all kinds of things. And with it, creates a kind of multi-tool mechanism. The only place I've seen this anywhere else, so this before Max is in the European Union, putting complementary policy tools together. There's a huge incentive to avoid the fee entirely. If you as a firm, your performance is high and the state is in full compliance with the next set of regulations. I don't know if domestically we're gonna be able to do that with real integrity. If we can or continue to move in that way, then I'll throw out MBAM as, an, as, a, as a complimentary piece. Uh, and in this case, could the US as a leading oil and gas producer, if it can get to a credible regime, could you begin to do this? At the very end of your comment, you threw out the acronym college. This becomes an explosive political issue, not just in the United States. But there I would note the irony in our Canadians about this all the time when I when I spend time in Ottawa. They do not have a methane price, but they move aggressively through regulations over the last 10 years. And a big portion of why British Columbia is really which produces a lot of natural gas is positioning itself as an expanding player, is they have the carbon tax, they've got the regulations in place, and they see themselves as an energy supplier for Asia. So yes. All right. Um, we've run our the course of our hour. I'm grateful for everybody. My concluding remarks are simply thank you for having me. Why don't I suggest, Max, if you have any closing things we forgot to talk, and then you should do the same thing, Barry, and then we'll turn it over to shooting just for closing comments. Thank you. Yeah, just very briefly, I mean, uh, we, we didn't talk about whether this is inevitable, CBAM, whether it's the only way to go. And of course, there are other ways. You mentioned regulation and standards. That's of course, and they can be complementary and uh, part of the mix. They can be more important or less important. They can close the gap, or they can also replace. If you don't do a CBAM, if you don't do a carbon border adjustment, you can also achieve a lot through standards, um, avoiding basically the whole discussion about trade issues because then it's a domestic. Um, but. So just saying there's a lot out there to consider and depending what the political space allows, right? We, we know we need to move to certain climate targets. And so if we agree that we wanna go there, that doesn't mean we all have to go there the same way. And I think that that's very important that we recognize this. It's not about that it looks all very symmetrical and organized. It's important that we arrive at the goal at the end. Sure. First, I want to just thank everyone from the Scanet for allowing this conversation to take place and the invitation to be part of it. I do think for me, this entire conversation underscores this is really an intriguing, important area of the climate policy agenda going forward in the US and internationally. This is not going to go away, nor should it. But if it is going to go forward, it has to be done in a way that it's really transparent, credible, effective, designed to last long term. We haven't even talked about the challenges that an individual nation launches, launches its own variant of CBAM. What that might trigger, what that might mean for other forms of trade relations in a world where trade, trade governance, and trade relations are getting more and more afraid. Would like to think in a world where the pieces are kind of coming off in terms of international cooperation and governance in so many areas, would it be exciting if somehow climate and energy is horribly divisive areas domestically and internationally? Could be some way to sort of show how you would piece together a more constructive kind of regime. How far are we away from a carbon pegali? Talking about decades, or could this be done in their time for the reasonable time? Thanks. Yeah, for me, very quickly, uh, thank you all very much for coming here today. Um, I know we didn't have time to get to the QA session, but I look forward to chatting with you all during our networking session. Our delicious cookies and then brownies and tea and coffee, if you would like to stay available to stay. Um, I would like you all to please uh, remember this, this point when you uh, come up with carbon water adjustment or carbon fee, carbon border tax, any sort of those words, when you read news articles or hear about this senator or congressman talk about that, I, I would like you all to take a pause and think about what are they talking? Are they talking about real carbon border adjustment? 
or just tariffs? And are they talking about, are we doing any domestic carbon price in the US or no? And it, it's, uh, I know I've said it a couple of times, but I like to reiterate that it's very important that we talk about carbon border adjustment in the context of a domestic carbon price in the US. Otherwise, it just doesn't really make sense to go ahead and do a carbon tariff when we're not putting a price on our domestic uh, producers. It's, it's violating WTO rules. We're, we're discriminating against foreign producers. Um, a lot of problems. So I, I, I want to emphasize that if, if we're not going to have a carbon uh, price in the U.S., I think Let's not let's not put our efforts on uh, carbon tariffs. I think that that would be really problematic. And um, I think in in the short, I'm optimistic at one point that you guys will have a carbon. Tariff. So that's that's what's keeping me working hard every day. But we'll see. I move that we adjourn to cookies. And <laughs>